Good afternoon. How are you all doing? Is everybody eating and happy? Good afternoon. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really thrilled to introduce this uh, fireside chat, I guess it is, right? And um, with two of my favorite people, and uh, two people who have a huge amount of history with A2IM um, that some of you may know and some of you may not. So uh, for those of you who know, I'm sorry if I'm going to bore you, but I, I won't go on for very long. So we have Molly Newman, who's now... Uh, who's going to be talking to Jen, um, and she is uh, the chief marketing officer at Downtown. But what a lot of people don't know about Molly is Molly was here right at the very beginning of A2IM, even before A2IM was formed. Thank you. Check, check, and, check. and right before I took this job, she was uh, acting president of A2IM. So I, I was actually rooting for her to get the job, and then she told me she didn't want the job, so <laughs> I got stuck with it. How do you feel and about that seven years later, Richard? I'm, I'm feeling all right. I know what you meant, though. <laughs> you knew stuff I didn't know. Um, but then. But we're Jen, still here. We're still here. We're still here. But Jen worked for A2IM for eight years. I think a lot of you might know that. But what's more important about Jen uh, in this regard is she started Indie Week. And I was at that first Indie Week. I've been at every Indie Week ever since. <laughs> yeah, seriously. What a, what a great thing, right? And so thank you so much, Jen. And I'm dying to hear this. And uh, Jen's the guest of honor today. Thank you, Molly, so much for doing this. Thank I'm you, Jen, for doing this. thrilled to be here. <laughs> thank you, Richard. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our chat. We're going to start the clock so we keep on time, right? Yeah. Um, we run a tight ship. Much tighter ship than when um, I worked at A2IM, so that's a good thing. <laughs> Richard, thank you so much. Um, and hi, it's wonderful to see so many friends and family um, and here to talk about Jen's career. Um, she's you know, done so much for our community um, as independents and um, you know, her story is, you know, interesting, compelling, and, and I think inspiring, and um, I think we all need a little bit of inspiration sometimes in, in this work, because also as independents, it's not always easy. Um, so, you know, we're going to spend uh, some time talking about your journey, Jen, and introduce it or what, you know, part of how you got to even the music industry, um, but also certainly your connection to Indie Week and, you know, as you're um, in your role of head of um, Indies at uh, Spotify on the um, global partnerships commercial partnerships team, um, you know, what you're doing now and, and what you're, you and the company are doing to really help support the independent community. So thank you all for being here. Um, and I'm really honored to, to be here as a friend and as someone who, you know, cares a lot about our independent community as well. You know, it's, I love to be able to help celebrate women and um, celebrate women who are doing so much um, to help drive change and not just for other women, but for all of us. So that's one thing that's really wonderful to have you here. Um, we definitely both share that deep connection to HYM. I only worked there for about 15 months, I think. It was actually quite short, but um, a wild ride and um, my my, my daughter was so tiny at the time. I was like, I don't think this is right for me right now. Um, but luckily, Richard was was ready there to take over the reins. Um, but yeah, our deep connection to to A two I M and also to one another, I think, is why you know we hope to have a really good conversation here. So, um, you're. Passion for music, I think, is one thing that's really, you know, meaningful to me. And, and, you know, so I'd love to just kind of give everybody the context of, like, even in high school, what you got started and how you, you know, really kicked off your career and how you ended up, you know, buying and selling records on the Lower East Side and, you know, what that <laughs> means for us today. Awesome. Thanks, Molly. Um, yeah, so I always wanted to work in music. I think I was five when uh, I started taking piano lessons, heard the cello, fell in love, started playing cello. Um, and I told my best friend uh, when we met the first day of middle school that I was going to run a record label someday. And I was 12. <laughs> and so, um, you know, when I finally uh, got a little older, got to high school, um, my parents uh, like it's time to go get a job and I went down to the local mall and applied all the places and uh, the record store was the only one that called me back. They said that <laughs> I had this look in my eyes like I have to work here, you know? And um, There probably weren't that many other 
girls selling records in, in Actually, high school? Actually, the owner was a woman. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Nice. So the owner was a woman. And this is um, St. Louis. This is this is Chicago. Oh, Chicago. Okay. So this was in the suburbs of Chicago. Okay. This was um, the first store I worked at was like a Ticketmaster location. So nice. uh, we would, you know, get up early, 9 a.m. Saturday morning, there'd be people already like sleeping outside the store to sell tickets to new shows or whatever. Um, and so, uh, yeah, working in Chicago, I was going to shows like every weekend. I was going to like five or six shows, spending a lot of time at the Metro with Joe Shanahan. And um, yeah, just really like learning a lot about music and, and why people were, were passionate about music. I went to college, uh, got a business degree from Boston College, but knew the whole time I wanted to run a record label. So all of my classes, I just sort of focused them around, you know, music, like entrepreneurship, starting a label. Um, you had a very tactical approach, which is yes. kind of mature for a lot of us. I was not in that zone by any means. My son complains. He's like, I have no idea what I'm going to do when I grow up. I'm 14. Like, how, you know, my life is over. You know, it's like, no, you're going to be just fine. Um, but I worked at record stores in uh, Chicago, in Boston, um, uh, New York, uh, San Francisco. Um, I, uh, I started when I first graduated college. I applied to a bunch of labels. Nobody called me back. I was running out of money. And I, my mother was like, McDonald's is hiring. And I was like, I cannot do that. And so I went you back. You literally had a degree from right. Boston College. Yes, exactly. Right. Okay, she was good. like, how much did I pay for that? <laughs> um, so yeah, so I, I just started applying. And, and uh, I went to every record store I could find. There was one called Mondo Kim's in the East Village. Uh, on Does anyone Mondo's. remember Mondo Kim's? I know a few of you. Yeah, right. OK. <laughs> so that was my first job out of college, was managing Mondo Kim's. I had 70 employees, and um, I thought it would be owned by this really cool woman named Kim. Uh, it was not. It was, uh, <laughs> anyone seen the documentary, it was owned by young man Kim, and there was like a whole story there that I will not get into right now. But um, there, I was the dance music buyer, and so I just started meeting people who worked at labels and distributors, and um, you know, buying music, learning about music, talking to people about music, and um, really just kind of finding my niche. And uh, within the dance music community, I met a lot of people that uh, were also really passionate about it, which led me to San Francisco. I'd been on a boat party out there, so my friends from college were living out there. And I was like, that's what I want to do. New York's a little too hardcore. I'm a little too young for this. And, uh, and so I went out to San Francisco for four years and worked at a record store there. Then that led to me um, meeting up with the K7 people and uh, starting their West Coast operation. It was commission only for uh, the wow. first year and a half. So the first month I actually lost money because I had to buy a fax machine and a <laughs> phone line. And um, I mean, there's a couple things I just think for, for the variety of uh, generations that are in this room uh, <laughs> that I think, you know, we've, we've kind of touched on a few things that are super relevant to the fact that you work in, you know, the, the big biggest music uh, <laughs> company in the world now that is, you know, streaming only and fully digital and, you know, like very innovative and, and transformative for industry. But your your origin coming from selling, you CDs know, 12 inch, you vinyl, know, yeah. yeah, vinyl records and CDs um, and what that transaction and, and what that sort of commercial environment was like for people is super important. But then also... Has anyone in who's maybe you know in their first or second job ever heard of being commission only? <laughs> like, that doesn't really exist anymore. So you know, but you took a leap of faith. I took a leap of faith, and I you just wanted passion. this. Yeah. yeah, I was so passionate about it. I was willing to do whatever it took. I was like, this is what I'm like meant to do. And within like a year and a half, I, I don't know for anyone who, who knows K7, we put out the candy sessions. I think in one month I made more than this, the owner. And he was like, okay, so the commission worked out for you. Taking you yeah. off commission right. now. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so that worked out well. Um, but yeah, so, so I was working there. I was working at Accelerator Magazine. We had started like an internet radio station called the Beta Lounge. And, uh, you know, we'd hang out and talk about music and tech. And I was like, you know, digital is going to be the death of the music industry. And I, I wasn't wrong. Um, that is funny. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, no, it's going to be this level playing field. It's going to be amazing for music. And uh, it took a while to get there. You know, yeah. I think they now rub my face in it that I was I was totally wrong because I would go head to head with them on this. It helped them out anyway. It you really still helped them out. Um, but those people <laughs> are the people who went on to like start iTunes or, you know, Napster or Rhapsody or, or whatever. And, and But in your... So at your during your tenure at K7, where there was this sort of like early 2000s, early to mid 2000s transformation from physical to digital, or, or legitimate digital, let's put it, um, you you were still part of the more traditional part of the 
oh. of the company and a little skeptical about the future. This, yeah. Oh, right. the very beginning, for yeah. sure. I mean, this was like 97 okay. to like okay. 99. Pre, like, pre, like. Pre everything. The cliff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so I moved back to um, uh, New York with my husband, Laurent, um, in 2001. Um, and at that point, the internet, you know, was kind of killing the music <laughs> industry. There was like a lot of. Is it like, okay to just say that you did meet at Meetem? We did meet at Meetem. <laughs> <laughs> at a conference. So um, sometimes these conferences work out in different ways. Exactly. <laughs> there actually have been like, for, sorry, jumping ahead, but like one-on-ones that I set up at Indie Week where people ended up getting married. Yeah. So I'm very proud of that. I love that. Um, I like connecting people. It, it's my New it's revenue my line. Exactly. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so when I was at uh, K7 2005, there was an indie summit, which uh, iTunes brought like 200 indie labels out to San Francisco to learn about what iTunes was going to be. And we were one of the first ones to Anyone sign up. Anyone else there at that? Indie there, summit? There's a couple of people. Adam? Yeah. Okay. Really? <laughs> Only one person in this room? I'm shocked. Um, anyway, so we were one of the first 200 to sign up as an indie label for, for iTunes. And I think within a year, it was like 70% of our revenue. Um, you know, being in dance music, iTunes, um, and, and all the people I knew in San Francisco were like running that team. So, um, you know, they were, they were helping me to navigate it. So um, at that at that time um, was when A2IM was formed. Yeah, so that is a, you know, I think we share a connection and not having known one another then, but um, the the driver for the launch of A2IM was a, is a woman named um, Leslie Bleakley from um, Beggars, who's been there, how many years, Nabil? Like 40 now? Yeah, like, a million. <laughs> I mean, she's been, she is OG, um, a testament to, you know, the stability of Beggars, but also, you know, sort of that same thing of innovation and and looking forward and building community we're going to touch on a few elements of that but you know since aim in the UK already existed um, and beggars and Martin Mills were a key part of that um, Leslie as the small crack team of beggars people at that time was um, you know let's she gathered a bunch of people in a room at ASCAP um, and said, hey, we got to do this. Yeah. And um, that was 2004. And, you know, by 2005, HYM launched. And so that was wonderful. But I think you know, she was a big um, connection for both of us, even though we didn't know each other yet, yeah, to kind of yeah. say, oh, wait, there's this woman running a company. There's, you know, there's a community to tap into. There are people who do support one another. I was so skeptical, though. Like, there was an option to pay, like, two years dues up front. And I was yes. like, I'm going to pay one year because I <laughs> don't know if this is going to work. Like, a bunch of competitors getting together and, like, sharing ideas. Like, there's no way there's, anybody's going to do that, you know? But... Here we are. But, uh, but yeah, so. and, and, and then, you know, so the HYM being a foundation of, yep. of, you know, bringing a community together, I mean, it was, it was very hard to run companies prior to HYM's existence because you would share with each other in very ad hoc ways. Maybe yeah. like I remember being able to get a press list from a label when I was doing my early work. Oh, you were lucky. Yeah, very lucky. And yeah. and um, you know the press list. I don't think we have to manage in the same way anymore either. <laughs> There's so many different things. But but you know having this community of shared interest, a, a room of competitors, and being mindful about you know um, you know antitrust issues and laws, but um, being able to say we can be stronger together is yep. incredible. And, you know, so as part of that, like, next phase of your career arc was joining A2IM, Absolutely. right? Yeah, so how did that all come to be? Yeah, so, um, so my uh, son was born, and I, uh, you know, I couldn't go on, my DJs couldn't go on at four in the morning, and uh, my kids wake up at six. So anyway, progressed on to, to A2IM, and, uh, and I, I had loved A2IM. Like, I had already been, um, you know, a friend Remember. of the organization for three years. I had, um, was on the new media committee, with Molly. Um, I was on the uh, sync licensing committee. I was, you know, helping connect the music supervisors. I was working with the K7, with other A2IM members. And, um, you know, the new media committee was uh, talking about iTunes or MySpace music or I don't know, whatever other services were yeah. around back then. Um, 
and uh, and and then the opportunity came to to, to go to uh, to A two AM to work. And, and had you already started to have some more digital responsibilities at K seven by that? Well, point? Yeah, because I was like running the iTunes relationship. Got it. Got so, it. Like, right. That had already been going on for like three years. Right. Got it. Okay. Four years. Yeah. So um, you know, A two AM stands for independence um, and opportunity and a level playing field for uh, all indies. And um, that really spoke to me um, as far as like you know, my whole career had always been in the indie sector. Um, I'd always been sort of fiercely loyal uh, to indies and and so moving over to, to work at a2im and um, understanding that like a healthy indie uh, sector meant that you know it's gonna be a healthy music industry and uh, you know being able to have indies embrace niches um, they're more passionate about their communities they know their communities better than anybody and um, by able you know by representing those interests they're able to innovate to do really creative things because they know like what's in the in the best interest of, of their community um, the three key objectives for a2im back then and, and I assume that they are the same today uh, were education advocacy and and a level playing field for, for commerce opportunities. And uh, so those were, were three areas that were, were super important um, uh, to us as an organization, to kind of key selling points for uh, labels to join the organization. And, and they hired me to run their associate member program. Um, to by running the associate member program, I was bringing in companies, service providers that uh, could be helpful, could be additive to what those labels were trying to do. Um, we had a, a very extensive vetting process to kind of go through those service providers and make sure that um, their business model was in line with our kind of hopes and wishes for uh, the music industry. Um, I think 50% of the people who applied, we would we would reject. Um, but you know, we would find these companies. You know, Spotify. I think I, I sent. Daniel Eck a LinkedIn request in like 2010 and I was like I love what you're building it's gonna be amazing like whenever you're ready to launch in the US like you know look me up or whatever and that's awesome um and so Indie Week was ba um, born out of my, my job need to connect these associate members we had found that we thought were going to be really, really helpful to content owners and then connect the dots. Um, and so we reached out to the Recording Academy. They lent us their office. Uh, very, what very year was here. this again? This was 14 years ago. Okay. So this would have been uh, 2009. Got it. Okay. Yeah, 2009. Um, and uh, and so I would I did these one on ones and I was basically like okay content owners like all these labels distributors these are the people you guys need to meet they're doing cool stuff you've never heard of them but I'm just gonna make you a schedule and you're just gonna like have faith in me that I'm gonna introduce you to people that are gonna be good for your business and uh, and they showed up and there were music supervisors there there were digital companies there were uh, manufacturers and delivery platforms and and all these people and, and so they'd sit and they do the meetings and um, and it was it was a huge success I mean there's a couple of things it was very that, loud. That that you mentioned that, you know, I think are just important as sort of like, you know, also foundational aspects of, of your career and your journey is you're, you are very loyal. Mm -hmm. You are very like, you know, like, don't mess with me. <laughs> <laughs> she, don't mess with me because she will come for you. So, <laughs> this is true. Um, and, and I think that's true of almost, uh, you know, so many aspects of your life, yeah. which are, you know, an incredible, in, an incredible thing to see and, and for you to demonstrate, which is, you know, really important. But I think you also, you know, obviously A2IM starting and, you know, being you know, strapped for cash and trying to make it work and trying to keep it moving. And, you know, there was obvious value to present, but, you know, driving value for for the members was something that you you had your role was there to support right by finding new revenue opportunities by finding new partnerships yep. um, and and that was really a, a key piece of what HYM was trying to bring and then also trying to you know within that that ecosystem creating value for them on the one one on one so yep. I did want to kind of like put a beat on the uh, on the one on ones did anybody have uh, the the pleasure of being uh, you know on Jen's list of a one on one over the years <laughs> right like I mean a lot of you right like at least at least a quarter come on I don't want to raise your hand but but she did that fully manually she had the list of people from both sides of the house and she matched them up. And there was, and I, as when I did join the company, I, I did join A2M for a couple of years, uh, it, you know, I saw the work that she put into it and the thought and the, and the effort and it was, you know, really, really meaningful. And I think that, you know, when I came in, I was like, how can we scale this? How can we, you know, automate and, you know, where can we put all of the, the, the way to, to grow this so it's not such a heavy lift? But the fact that you knew these people so well yeah. 
And, you know, and I think that the network that you started to build at H2IM and for through your whole career that uh, really came to, to, to be there and then putting those pieces together with such intention, yeah. um, you know, like you said, people got married. <laughs> <laughs> I knew who needed to meet. I knew who liked each other. And I, and I would hear about these companies long before anybody else had. So I was like, oh my God, you know, like Spotify. I was like, oh my, like when you guys, when they finally joined, I put them through the ringer. I think there were three days of Indie Week meetings. They showed up. I'd booked 120 meetings for them across three days. It was like five an hour for eight hours straight. And like Steve Savoka and Katie Schlosser and Alex Rosenberg hated me. They were like, are you kidding? Where are we supposed to eat? And I was like, you find time like on your own. This is like important to the growth of your business. And uh, yeah. And so I did it for eight years. I think the final year that I did it, I booked 5,000 meetings like manually, like literally with like a pencil, like moving things. And then people would be like, oh, sorry, I didn't show up. And I'd be like, are you kidding? <laughs> well, I think Laurent and I both shared a little of that experience, uh, you know, like the, the time spent over those, yeah. those, that planning, you know, because you were so, your standard of service is very high. Um, and, you know, up like till two in the morning. He'd be like, seriously, Jen, you only got four hours of sleep last night. I'm like, but I'm I'm almost done, you know? Yeah, um, but, but yeah. you know, I mean, it was so, so important. And I think, you know, we, the, the, as you, you know, move towards in your career journey, you know, making that change and, and landing at Spotify, you know, the network that you built and the community that you built um, through the relationships um, that you have, um, you know, I just sort of thought maybe you could share a little bit about how that has, and I think a lot of us who have been part of A2IM over the years, um, share that sense of of rich, um, r you know, deep, sincere, uh, genuine relationships, um, which is in incredible. But you have a few people that you have worked with over the years that have come into your life that have been particularly meaningful. That I, I met think so it'd be great for you to know. Yeah, through A two I M. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, I uh, I met Molly through A two I M, which was amazing, and Leslie, obviously, who uh, was was hugely important to me and, and inspiring. She was she was such a mentor. She introduced me to Martin, um, also from who uh, has, has been a mentor for me for a lot of my career. Christina Zafiris, I don't know if anybody in this room knows her. I know she's not um, still in the music industry, but she was uh, very inspiring and, uh, and helpful and always encouraging me and, um, you know. Uh, Nudging you came, or kicking your butt into exactly. doing things, yeah. Better, like, you know, <laughs> This is uh, important. Allison Wenham, um, you know Millie and Maria and um, and Kat, a lot, just lots of, of fantastic women. I've also been really lucky to have some amazing men who've um, had my back and and been really um, inspiring to me uh, throughout my career. I obviously met my husband long before A Two I M, but he's always um, been a strong rock for me, um, so I can do all this crazy stuff and, and be as insane as I am. Um, but uh, <laughs> but he, he is my rock, and and I couldn't do any of it without him. Um, Rich Bangloff and, and Mahoney were always there as, as advocates and making sure that um, I was able to have the freedom to do what I wanted to do at A2IM and to really um, watch out for me and, and create space for me and um, create a, a job for me, basically, so that I could do what I loved and, and be a part of, of A2IM because they saw the value in that. Um, and then Alan uh, at, at Spotify, who's been there for me every step of the way. So, um, yeah, those are, are some people I wanted to shout out. But honestly, I see so many friends in this room. I. Uh, I'm, I'm so appreciative for this community um, because I, uh, I've been in Indies my entire life, 10 years at K7, eight years at um, A2IM, and, and six and a half at, at Spotify, and I just feel like really honored to have uh, this network and to be able to connect you guys because I think we just really are so much stronger um, together. I think, um, you know, the, the women that I've had the opportunity uh, to meet, I think, you know, we're still underrepresented um, in executive roles and um, in the charts and in, in song credits. Uh, they're just, they're, it's, it's not as even as it is in society. Um, and I think, you know, being able to just lift each other up as a community um, it's just really, really important. Um, I think I, there's the indie spirit of being able to just kind of start businesses and blaze your own path and, and lead so others can follow, um, I think applies to so many of us. And, uh, and having this network, I think, makes you stronger so that you can sort of take those risks and, and do the amazing things that you guys all do, so. It's, it's so true. Yep. <laughs> I know. We deserve a little bit of an emo moment, right? Like it's it's important, um, but you know, I think that they're just to sort of add to that. You know, we see in the in this audience, you know, a, a sort of full spectrum of you know all types of people, all generations, and and I think that's a, a an incredible thing. You know, and 
I think we, we are, we are going to talk a little bit about your, you know, your move to Spotify and how that came to be and what, you know, you're focused on there. But I think it's another example of, you know, kind of bringing these, all these different kinds of, of people and opportunities and, and also looking forward, which, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really incredible. So in 2018, you moved over 20, 2017. 2017. Okay, yeah. so you joined Spotify, um, and uh, that was a, a change for you. You kind of moved from a from you know you're as, you ha if you categorize them, you got your members at HYM and your associate members. You're going to the associate member zone, but clearly your expertise and your background with rights holders was something that was very compelling to the company for you to join them. 100%. I mean, at that point, I think there were 2,500 staff at Spotify, so it was a massive change. I mean, the <laughs> biggest company I'd worked at, I think we had like eight people in the office, right? HYM's so. offices are still in the same place as when Jen and I worked there. And, you know, sometimes it's a little wild. You got to walk over <laughs> to get into the office in the morning, right? So it's a little different when you got very there. Very different. Very, very <laughs> different. Uh, I remember when Cheryl came to visit me, she's like, you guys have both food this place is amazing you know? <laughs> um you know just unlimited snacks like that was you know mm -hmm. something she was very excited anyway um mm -hmm. yeah so so one of the reasons i think they hired me um at spotify was my network um at that point spotify had a, a pretty contentious relationship with the indies we didn't have tools or services we had no way of scaling to the amount of content that was coming on the platform or the amount of content owners that were bringing content to us um and you know it was like one person for each of the majors and then two people people for like all indies and and when I showed up I said great like you know where do I put my my database and like how do I get started sort of messaging things out to the community and they were like well I guess you can just keep that in an excel sheet <laughs> and I looked around and, and my team you know these two people they I mean bless them they uh had notebooks on their on their desks and they would do meetings every 30 minutes with different content owners and they would just write down their releases and then try and like track down the editors in the hallways to like tell them about the record and it was no wonder that nothing ever got playlisted and nothing was moving and nothing was happening and um it was just you had to, the scale was just getting, yeah. It, yeah things are bursting yeah and i remember when my my boss sat me down six weeks into the job and he said okay so like if you could change it if you could like make it actually work what would it do and i was like well if i could hire one person and he was like okay Jed like I know you come from the indie space but like you can hire more than one person um, you know, this, is, this is okay like you could actually do this and I was like "Ooh, okay and like got the whiteboard out and I was like this is how I would do it um and because so because you were kind of bringing this very scalable, lean yeah. But very functional and and a highly productive sort of model, yep. but you now had a different sense of resources. I had right. basically unlimited resources right. to do that. And so um, that was when, you know, I sort of built the indie team, when we started working on uh, the spreadsheets for anyone who, who worked with us back in the day and giving spreadsheets to all the partners that we needed to be able to track the releases that were coming through. And so those came into a CRM that I had built. And then from that, the playlist pitching tool was born. And so um, the playlist pitching tool uh, I'm still uh, incredibly proud of. Um, I think that was... Uh, How many you know, people have to use the playlist pitching tool every day, week, month? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, <laughs> Thank you for that. Were. I didn't see that. <laughs> um, David was part of that team and, and part of that crew. So... Um, yeah, and, and, and to build a team, right? And, and to have like a team of people that were there. Could we just p pause quickly on playlisting as a sort of concept? Because I think that's a, one other element of sort of like having the rights holder mindset and the shift that we've all, you know, sort of quickly adapted to. But, you know, we have in our community a very precious sense sometimes from our artists around what their albums are or what they're, what they're creating. And the playlisting and Spotify's like sort of, uh, you know, in, empowering, enabling, whatever it is to like, you know, find a new way of experiencing music is almost, we, everybody is on board now. Yes. But you probably had to deal with a lot of that skepticism around you know, like breaking up a record and and all of you know sort of how to yeah. you know thinking about that. But maybe we had adopted by by 2017. Like, yeah, because iTunes like people were already right. breaking it up for like 10 years at that right, point. Right, right. So like yeah, I think I mean I think I, I sort of came in after like the oh my god you're breaking up my album <laughs> into more of just like 
like embracing the discoverability. But you know, I think I don't know. Somewhere around that time, people started making T-shirts that said a playlist is not a marketing plan. You know, sure, um, right? That we, still holds, right? That tracks. We don't, we, you know, <laughs> we don't want to be the gatekeepers, but we want to make sure that we're getting all the information and we're creating a great listening experience because discoverability is like the superpower of Spotify. You know, we are we are there for 515 million listeners every single month, and um, you know, I think in what was it in 2022 we had 275,000 artists uh, programmed on playlists uh, across the globe, um, and and that's a number we're, we're really really proud of. Um, we have, we're live in 184 markets, and uh, you know between our algorithms and our editors, like they're using though that information that's submitted via the playlist pitching tool, but then a ton of other data right. from just people's like listening experience to be sure those tracks on an album are heard, but they're heard in the right context at the right time with the right listener, and that it's like a fantastic user experience. Um, and there are just, you know, I think now we're up to like 10,000 people or something that work at Spotify, and, and that's like the core function of Spotify. So 2,500 to 10,000 now in the time that you've been there. Yeah. Wow. So it's four times growth in six and a half years. It's, wow. Wow. Um, you know, but uh, but we've also expanded. I don't remember how many markets we were live in then, but right. we launched 90 markets like two years ago. So, um, you know, we're a lot of teams around the world focused on on that and just making sure that every song sort of has its home and has the opportunity to be heard and to sort of maximize that audience um, so that people, you know, who love music get the opportunity to discover it using Spotify. I mean, yeah, that's, that's I, and I mean, I mean I, I've, I'm privileged enough to be able to, you know, hear from you about how the business is transforming and how, you know, all of the new markets and new genres and, you know, it's like it's incredible incredible to see that as a as a partner to the industry growth from both a commercial and revenue perspective but also you know sort of creating new art opportunities for a whole different, you know, part of the world. It's it's wonderful. 100%. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think Spotify sort of staffs up in the right places to sort right. of say, like, how can we make this scalable? Um, you know, I think some people get frustrated. Like, they think there's, like, this hard wall and you can't reach somebody. And it's like, no, because we built tools and services so that we are scalable and that everybody has somebody. You just have to kind of, you know, use those scalable tools to be able to reach um, reach the right people who are going to make the right difference and, and the algorithm and, and everything else that... Um, is going to actually like make a difference. Um, and uh, and I think also having like sort of the right team in place, uh, I've, I've found a better sort of work-life balance. Right, um, good. I think, you know, when you have kids, you realize that you have to become way more efficient. Um, the time is really limited. And well, so you, I mean, I, if, if, I think one theme we've picked up on is you're pretty efficient, right? <laughs> like no matter what, whether kids or no. <laughs> You approach life from a very like, you know, we're going to deliver something here, right? Which is great. <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes um, some people in my personal life get a little frustrated with my calendar <laughs> and being like, okay, we'll just schedule time for that. You but know? you're and getting a lot done. So, you know, there's a there's something to, it, it works, right? It works. But, but I mean, I think that also, you know, relating to your role at Spotify specifically and, and your the, the work that you've been trying to um, drive is you had to build these processes. You had to, to build these, you know, sort of a, a, a new way for people to do that was somewhat scalable. But if I correct me if I'm wrong, and I, I'm sure you don't love this part of your life, but you do return pretty much every email and every really phone do. call. Yeah. I mean, that's a that's a. a, a uh, I, I can't say the same for myself. So, you know, I mean, I, like, I try to do everything I can to be, to, you know, make sure that I'm not a, a rude person. But but I think that's one of your personal values. But I even, I'm, like, write people back and I'm like, please remove me from your press releases because that is not the best use of your time. I'm not an editor. I'm not, you know... Um, what do they call it? Marketing. Radical candor? That's good. Yeah, right? but, I mean, but I'm like, you know, like, use the playlist pitching tool because that, if you actually want to reach, like, everyone at Spotify, that's how you do it. Right. And so, like, you're making it so that I'm just going to send your emails to spam because like if you keep just sending me press releases, I can't actually help the people who actually need me to help them or collect information from people that's going to be useful for us to build better tools and services for everybody in the future, right? right. So sometimes I, I may come off rude and I hope I haven't offended I'm anyone. I'm sure. You're, room, uh, but, who cares? Um, it's fine. <laughs> but, but, but I think honesty is, no, is I don't, the best. I, right? No, I think, on, you know, I think that's true. And I think, I don't think that you're, you know, I mean, I think I, I, we don't have to get on our high horses, but sometimes Sometimes when people hear women's voices being a little bit more clear, um, that sometimes gets interpreted in a different characteristic. So let's just say, 
I think your clarity is very, very helpful. And, um, you know, and, and obviously it's key to, you know, some of the, you've got to also make yourself available and your team's time available to the important things, right? Yeah. So there's a certain amount of like process that can be put in place, but there's a lot of manual work that you have to do. And I think our industry is is all sort of reckoning with, you know, a lot of issues around trust and safety and a lot of issues about preventing and, and fighting fraud and, and, you know, Spotify has to be a as the as the you know the ubiquitous service that you are around the world, you've got to be leading in that regard. And and I think, you know, whatever you, you feel is appropriate to share with the, with the audience. But you know, how are we and how are you looking at ways to you know support the industry? And then like that takes your time, right? You've got to like it's it's not an easy thing to to help support this being a trusted platform for the audience and for the the rights holders. You mean like as far as like fraud? Or, yeah, well, yeah. just in general. I mean, just like not to talk about the the actual work that you do, yeah. but just like I mean, I know enough about you that you you have to have a lot of conversations with people, okay, like yeah, and, and yeah. put it in context. Like this is a decision that was made. Like this is this we see this behavior happening, and we have to totally. respond to it because we need we want everyone to be. You know, this we want the good actors and the rights holders and the and the 100%. and the customers to be having a really good experience. Great user experience, great great experience for the for the industry. And and I, I've always kind of felt like I'm here to like protect the castle. Like leaving A two I M and going to Spotify. When when I uh, gave Richard the news that I was leaving A two I M, he was like, "This is actually probably a really good role for you." <laughs> um, you know, Spotify has been there for for indie since the beginning, and then I take it very seriously that um, you know if it's not Spotify, like who else is it going to be that's going to play this role within the music industry and so I do take it really personally when um, I feel like somebody's trying to game the system or you know not doing what's in the best interest um, for the audience or for their label and and, and fraud certainly comes into that um, I think you know there's been especially during COVID when people couldn't tour and, and, and what have you a lot of these services popped up that were like oh you can like buy followers like why go on tour why you know you can buy followers you can buy listeners and, and a lot of artists and a lot of labels tried it right um, and you know I I started clicking on them because I was like turning them into our fraud team, but um, <laughs> and then suddenly my Instagram became like this, just this like circle of like fraud, like everywhere that I turned. Um, uh, and it's it's a game of whack-a-mole. You know, these these people are, are everywhere and they're trying to steal money from the music industry. You know, you're you're looking for good marketing solutions, and you know if it if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah. Um, and I've had so many hard conversations with artists and labels who you know artists is going out on tour or something, or you know just released their their album and they've put all this money into playlist pitching or, you know, these kind of like, oh, you'll get this number of listeners and, and then their content gets taken down and it's, it's heartbreaking. Right. Because they are, you know, coming from such a good place, and then and then they just made a, a bad choice. Um, uh, so a lot of what I work on is is education. Um, I think many of you have seen me do master classes. That's always something I I talk about. I think it's just really important for people to know that that's like not a good option. Um, there's so many other things that you can uh, do with marketing and, and with marketing dollars um, to be more effective. And, and you guys have seen, like in the last few years, we've introduced more marketing tools because we're like, well, I think we could actually probably build better marketing tools and if you're looking for ways to like find new audiences like that are legitimate and and right. actually strategically applied can really be beneficial and i can't tell you how many meetings i've sat through about like how to price these things and like you know <laughs> like you know making it fair and making it efficient and making it something that like is scalable and that anybody can access um you know it's it's really important to kind of our core um you know north star goal which is to have a million artists live off their art and a billion people to enjoy and be inspired by it and that means a great user experience and it also means a lot of artists having the tools at their fingertips to, to do what they need to do. Um, but I'm really excited about Music Fights Fraud. I don't know if anybody saw the announcement yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm tired of playing this game of whack-a-mole where like they come up over here and then you take them down and then they pop up over here and you're just like, I'm tired of this game. Um, so uh, having, you know, some distributors come together to kind of share information through this um, NCFTA uh, cyber fraud, I'm not I don't remember all the Yeah, but I mean but. it's it's I think it's an incredible testament to also the times that we're in where we have you know an industry-wide representation of companies like Downtown and Fuga and CD Baby and TuneCore and Believe and and Symphonic and Spotify and you know Amazon and and you know we all know that we have to work on this problem together and if it's if you know the tenacity of 
of people who want to do bad things is always mind boggling to me. Like I never can relate to how smart you have to be to try to steal money, but it's incredible. And, and we can't oh, there's like total scammers, like yeah. people like who are not it's, from the music industry. It's wild. And, it's like, and, and exactly. That. But they find cracks in, you know, whether it's with this one company and then we'll bounce to another and, and to have the support of the services and the, the distributors is, you know, an incredible, I think a, a testament to some progress that we're seeing in our industry um, and sort of like some of us checking our, you know, specific interests at the door to think about the long-term health. That was something we, we touched on briefly. We had the fortune to, to be in a room last night with a lot of people who have been, been involved with H2IM over the years. Um, and, you know, that was sort of the found, and I think you, you it's Tom Silverman, Tom Silverman um, gave you a, a, a something that I think is something for us to kind of center a little bit on, yeah, on your that, yeah. career. Yeah. So last night, Tom, I saw Tom Silverman and, and he was one of the people who interviewed me for my job at A2IM. He was also a founding board member with Molly. And, uh, and he said, you know, back then we sort of saw this like opportunity where, um, you know, iTunes had just launched and we were like, we have to put A2IM together so that, you know, it's a level playing field. And, you know, at that point they were playing 65 cents to indies and 70 cents to the majors. And then we formed and then like two weeks later, they like, Quickly up to the rates to oh never mind everybody seventy cents you know um, and, please don't uh, try to get otherwise the indies right, anymore but no not you <laughs> <laughs> but anyway he said you know back then we we saw that there was this opportunity in this time and we were going to like come together and like share information and make sure that the playing field stayed level and he's like and now fifteen years later everybody's sort of riding the wave of like okay like people are paying for music piracy is you know uh, not dead but like it's it's not the the issue that it was and and real revenue is sort of flowing back into the music industry and he's like you know now we need to think about where are we going to be 15 years from now you know what are the opportunities we want to embrace what are the issues we want to stop um, because if we don't get ahead of it um, are we going to be back where you know CDs exploded and then piracy it's like you know this kind right. of up and down in the music industry um, you know thinking about where we want to be 15 years from now what are the things we need to come together as an industry to uh, to fight and to support uh, so that there is a great music industry um, um, for the next generation. I think that's, you know, something we, we, we need to come together as an industry and, and really think about. Yeah, I mean, it's, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I mean, I think yeah, it's... that flew by. I know, I know, I knew it would. Um, and you, you still, if there's anything you want to make sure we, we, we you know, touch oh, on yeah. that you... But, you know, I mean, I think obviously the growth of our or the, sort of the regrowth of, of the music industry driven by streaming, um, you know, supported by companies like Spotify, supported by the collaboration between the independent community and the services. Um, and, and also obviously we're looking forward. Like, you know, we don't, we've got some problems that we're trying to tackle, like, you know, and the initiative and the alliance around music fights fraud is, is part of that. But we're looking at new ways of being open, right? I mean, your company is definitely always looking ahead, right? Right, not behind, yep. and um, you know, I just kind of give you the platform to kind of speak a little bit about, you know, how that looks in the future, and and how you know how you want to be collaborating with the community. One hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, like I think the the first five hundred uh, million people that we got on platform um, was from you know us really sort of like focusing on um, uh, subscriptions and, and growth into into new markets. But you know the next five hundred million are going to be really doubling down in those markets. We're going to have five hundred million more customers. I know exactly <laughs> a billion users. That's our that's our goal. Um, you know our ad revenue topped a billion. So uh, just last year for the first time. Um, I think, you know, as of a year ago, we had put more money into the music industry than any retailer uh, in the history of the music industry, even when you account for inflation. Um, you know, I think we're going to keep pushing that number up and up and up every year. Um, you know, it is our goal. It's, it's very much um, at the core. Um, and we're going to continue to build tools for artists and for labels so that they can tell their stories and their own voices and they can find their own audiences and they can get closer to a million artists living off their art. Um, I think, you know, there's uh, making a niche, um, every niche having a home on Spotify, I think is, is really uh, important to us and um, ideas coming from you guys as a community and, and feeding those uh, back in. We want to hear from you. We want to know, you know, what would be impactful to your business? What crazy ideas do you have that would make the, the platform better? Um, we, uh, we want to work with you guys more. So, um, yeah. 
Well, I can say thank you thank for you. your work um, and for you know the the journey so far and for the you know road ahead. I know your support for independence, your passion, your commitment, your uh, loyalty are all so critical. And I think we're all I could speak for the HYM community to say thank you and um, thank you for everything. Thank you.